Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Tony Joseph and we are going to discuss his book, The Early Indians, which actually throws light on who we are and also what kind of, shall we say, history do we have as people. The, not the written history, which is much shorter, but actual history of the people of the subcontinent. Tony, what made you write this book? Because you're not somebody who's either from history, archaeology, or genetics. The three things you really discuss here. I was always fascinated for some odd reason by the Harappan civilization, ever since I heard about it. And it's not that I had great interest in history in particular, but the Harappan civilization, it, it really uh, captured my imagination. And uh, when I had time on my hands some six years ago, I thought I would try and understand and try to answer three questions which had never really been answered, which is who were the Harappans, where did they disappear, and why did it take more than a thousand years after their civilization declined for cities uh, to and urbanism itself to begin Second in India urbanization again. to come up. To that come was up, the yeah. first urbanization. This That's is the right. second urbanization that takes So place. then I started going to all the Harappan sites in Dholavira, Lothal, in Gujarat, in Raghigadi, in Haryana. Then following that up, visits with uh, archaeologists, historians, linguists, epigraphists who have all done work on the Harappan civilization. But you didn't go to Mohanjadar or Harappa in I, uh, West Pakistan? I had tried that earlier, but they never gave me the visa. So, so I had to do that without that. So then you realize that you really can't answer the questions about the Harappans unless you went back thousands of years earlier because it is very clear from the archaeological record that the Harappan civilization rose naturally out of the uh, agricultural revolution that happened in northwestern India. In fact, it's also quite interesting the archaeological work done by Pakistani scholars who have talked about the growth of the city as it arises in yes. different layers. And it's clear there's a continuous growth that takes place, Absolutely. as you were saying, with yeah. agrarian uh, developments are taking place around yes. it. So the question of who were the Harappans naturally evolved into who were the first farmers, which naturally evolved into, you can't really answer that unless you ask the question, who were the first Indians? So gradually, the scope of my work expanded enormously from from who were the Harappans to who, who are us Indians and somewhere along the line or you South discovered, Asians or, or South Asians yeah Indians is used in this book in its old sense not in its uh, subcontinent current sense, sense. Yeah. subcontinent sense. and uh, then you realize that a lot of new findings were coming from a field called population genetics which I had not paid uh, enough attention to six years ago then you started following that up, which took an enormous amount of time to uh, to fully get on top of it. So that's how it began. That's also interesting because the genetics, the population genetics that you're talking about, has been there, say, from 90s, even earlier, that's right. looking at blood groups and so on. Yes. But the refinement really comes with actual genetic information. Yes. But that also was relatively, shall we say, weak, because you could only look at certain locations of change. That's right. And you couldn't really look at the whole genome. That's right. And the recent uh, advances have been, of course, not because of archaeology or history, yes. but because of other reasons that you can se sequence the whole genome. Absolutely. And that has made the whole thing far more uh, shall we say, elaborate and far uh, more sophisticated its analysis. Exactly. So how does the whole genome sequencing yeah. and how does it relate to the latest findings, in which case we're talking uh, really of the Reich papers, which yeah. are also in Europe, uh, yeah. talked about Europe and then also about yeah. uh, the subcontinent. Yeah. I think the whole genome sequencing less, did, did take uh, our understanding a whole lot farther than we knew earlier. For example, the 2009 paper clearly said that North Indians are far more closely related <coughs> to West Eurasians, that is West Asians, Central Asians, Europeans, than South Indians are. But it could not really answer the question, but how did this relationship come about? Uh, did the North Indians move to these West Eurasian places, or did they come to India? There's no way that the uh, science, even whole genome sequencing of living populations could co solve that problem. That's where the next really major advancement came in, which is ancient DNA. Archaeogenetics, as, as it is called. That's right. That is DNA of people who lived thousands or tens of thousands of years ago. If you were to explain how that changed, uh, let's say in Delhi, 
we have an archaeological site from where we have collected DNA from a level that is about 4,000 years old and you see that there is no vestation ancestry there. But from a level that is 3,000 years old, you do see there is vestation ancestry. Then it is a clear conclusion that in this site, there, is, there has been a new uh, in incoming flux. or inflow of, of vestation ancestry. So, and this has changed our understanding of prehistory across the world. And this is an important point. It's not just South, it's not our understanding, re, re, uh, the clarity about our understanding of prehistory is not specific to India. It's specific, it's, it's happening all across the world. In fact, the interesting part of the close parallels yes. that you see between the European, shall we say, expansion yes. and the two expansions, one is of agriculture yes. and agriculturists yes. and the other expansion is the uh, from the steppes population, yes. those who uh, control the horses Correct. and probably the chariots uh, and therefore could use it for war. Correct. And this, the two influxes also seem to show yes. uh, also its marks in, uh, shall we say, the subcontinent. Yes. And so there is in both cases, you yes. see uh, an ancient population and these two influxes that takes place to change this changes the genetic composition. That's right. In, in, in Europe, as you said, we know that uh, uh, in the last 10,000 years, the population went through two major periods of churn. First, when agriculturists or farmers from West Asia, from the Anatolian, uh, Anatolian uh, or what is today called yeah. Turkey, they moved into Europe, either replacing or mixing with existing hunter-gatherers. And then again, 5,000 years ago, when uh, Central Asian um, steppe pastoralists, what they call Yamnaya, moved into Europe, uh, then again, replacing or mixing to some extent with the existing uh, farmers as well as the remaining hunter gatherers. So, so now you know the that Black the, that's sea, the European population. The Black Sea, Ural, this thing, that, that yeah. part, the Caspian Sea, that part of the uh, Central Asian steppes as it were. That's right. And, but I think we today, because of ancient DNA, we today have a much more cohesive understanding of how global populations everywhere were formed. I would say that we now know that there are, uh, you know, migrations happen all the time in all the places. But As somebody has said, people have feet, move, yeah. only trees have roots. Right. But that doesn't help you understand. So how do you make, uh, is there a method to understanding this? There is. We know from, uh, from all the discoveries that have happened in the recent past that the world population was essentially formed by four classes of migrations, uh, which, all of which had global impact and all of which were driven by global forces, by which I mean that we, when we look back today, we can understand why those migrations happened at that time and why they were so major. For example, the first one is, of course, the out of Africa migrations, which everyone knows about, which is that around 70,000 years ago, uh, Africans, a small group, a subset of the Africans moved out of Africa into the, uh, and then the populated recent, the entire world. Examples seem to show that they have had earlier also people moving out, but they don't survive with the genetics That's genetics right. of the population today. Yeah. So probably the successful one is seventy thousand years old. That's correct. But earlier DNA is still there in some form or the other with the Neanderthal population. That's correct. There might have been. I mean, this is the argument of uh, if if you look at if you ask the archaeologists the, about uh, when did the world get populated, you will get. A different answer from uh, from when you ask geneticists, and that's that's understandable because they are answering different questions. Correct. Archaeologists are answering the question of when did when uh, uh, they are looking at evidence left behind by modern humans, and then answering the question when did the first modern humans arrive. So geneticists artifacts. are an, artifacts. Geneticists are answering the question when did our direct ancestors uh, or arrive. Those are slightly different uh, questions, and that explains the the difference in this. The lineage that we come from, that right. genetic signature, yeah. that is what we that's trace right. back to the seventy thousand years back. That's right. So, so earlier, earlier migration. things may not have left behind uh, a lineage that we that is today visible in the in in the population, or very minor signatures, because yeah. Neanderthal signatures. 
uh, is yeah, also there. No, so, yeah, but they are not modern humans. But yeah, there is intermixing that happened with other Homo lineages, definitely. But like that, they might be in the future. We may detect uh, uh, what shall I say lineages from uh, earlier modern modern humans, which today we can't. It's possible. So this is the first migration, and the global force that was behind it, we could say, are climatic factors, and which determine not just human migration, but migration of all all animals. The second migration is more interesting, and um, and but before that, as the people, as the out of Africa migrants were peopling the whole world between about seventy thousand years ago and around sixteen thousand years ago, which is when they reached the Americas. That's the period that that the expansion took place. But uh, bet in between this long period, there was a period, there was a glacial period that intervened which meant uh, that m many of these population groups were separated from each other and developed along slightly different paths, accumulating minor genetic differences. It's important to know that even today, all modern humans share 99.9% .9 of For our the DNA. The argument is that the genetic diversity among the entire human population yeah. is less than that of a troop of baboons or yeah. a troop of chimpanzees in Africa. Yeah. That's the difference of That's, lineages yeah. that we have, yeah. almost entirely a common lineage. Yeah. So when the uh, glacial period ended, what you see is that uh, modern human populations in various parts of the world are experimenting with agriculture. And uh, some of those are successful, some are not. Some are successful but are not sustainable. Some are sustainable but are not very advantageous, like the people in in the Pacific Islands or in Southeast Asia who were among the first to start uh, experimenting with agriculture, but they had av locally available materials, only yams and tubers which are not very productive. But those early modern human groups who were in, lucky enough to be in locations which had where they could domesticate cereals, wheat, barley, rice, etc., they were very productive. And these are the Chinese, the Indians, the Mesopotamians, the Egyptians, they all started agriculture which boomed and the natural result of humans, modern humans taking to agriculture was, uh, that was a boom in population and it, it, incomparable to the rate at which hunter-gatherer populations grow. And the natural result of those, that boom in population was migrations and these migrations affected all of the world in every region. The, the migrations resulting from uh, agricultural uh, expansion, the first agricultural ex uh, so coming, transition. Coming back to this, one was the Anatolian one that we talked about. Yeah. Uh, other one is the one coming to South Asia from the Zagros Mountains in Iran. Yes. That's the second level of, second set of migrations taking place roughly at the same time, which comes into South Asia. That's correct. We also know, for example, a little later, because China probably took to agriculture in a major way a little later. We also know there are major migrations that happened from China, China too, that affected all of Southeast Asia and even us to some extent. So the second set of my class of migrations, which are, we could call the uh, farming related or Neolithic migrations, are a major force that shaped global uh, populations. So Neolithic farmer migration. Yes. Now, now there is a third class of migrations uh, which happen when some modern uh, human population groups, uh, as we discussed earlier, master the art, uh, master the horse, and also to some extent uh, the the art of metallurgy, and which gives them both mobility and uh, and an ability to uh, to move into new areas that had not been uh, that uh, and conquer them. And uh, so this is something that affected again global populations across a vast region of Eurasia from the from Iceland to to Europe to uh, to Central Asia to West Asia to India to China so this would you would say is a third class of migrations you could tentatively call it uh, bronze age migrations or horse related because horse find related out, because yes. bronze age is already there with the the next stage of the Neolithic farmers in Harappa or in Sumeria, Mesopotamia, Babylon and so on. That's right. You could say mobility is the key part. Mobility and war is the key part. The, because the these were pastoralists yes. who were not 
city dwellers. Yes. And we have seen again and again yeah. uh, people who are militarily mobile, yeah. whether it's the Mongols yeah. or it's the, shall we say, the Europeans in the ships yeah. who then are able to overthrow yeah. more settled empires based on more urban, uh, shall we say, uh, population. Yeah, population. there is some disagreement over to what extent, um, uh, the, even in Europe, even though there is greater evidence of, uh, of uh, burials of men who have great wounds and have great battle access with them, which are all new in Europe, as a result of pastoral migrations into Europe, even then, I would say there are disagreements on how violent it was and, or, and how gradual and over yeah, a period of time you know, it happened. That's a matter of details for the historian. That's right. But the point is, mobility is a new element yes. with the horse that we see. Absolutely. And we see the expansion of this population over a vast land. Yes. Okay. Almost all of and, Eurasia. You know, yes. it's not very different from the Mongol expansion much later. Yes. Genghis Khan's descendants are the most, the genetic signatures yes. of the highest number yes. is from Genghis Genghis Khan. Okay. Now, that is not explained by agriculture or civilization. It's agriculture by essentially what would be called elite dominance. Yeah. Uh, so, this is the third class of migrations, you could say. There's also the, all these three happened broadly in what you could call prehistory or before most human population groups had taken to writing. But the fourth class is equally important and that we are all aware of, very keenly aware of because we or our parents or our grandparents have been affected by it, which are colonial migrations. Colonial migrations. That uh, this is when modern human, some modern human population groups mastered how to travel the seas in a very fast manner, invented steamships and uh, conquered vast we, territories. We will park that discussion for a separate time. Yeah. No, unless I you would have just, a specific no, no. thing on it. So here are these four classes of migrations. When you come to India, uh, you see that the last one is immaterial to us because it didn't leave it didn't affect our genetic composition in any which manner because Except the numbers speaking were speaking english which is the remnant of the colonial culturally uh, yes when i say they not yeah, not genetically impact, but gen culturally yeah, culture. uh, so so what i want to say is that out of these four classes of migrations as far as indian genetic his, uh, composition is concerned we need to concern ourselves with only, only the first three only the first three now, you know, this of obviously has made a huge, uh, uh, come up against a huge resistance, shall yeah. we say, of those who have talked about Akhanda Bharat, Punya Bhumi, yeah. and Hindus being the ancient people, yeah. Aryan civilization has been risen only from India and gone yeah. out. So all of that, yeah. uh, which I will call humbug history, has been... Uh, which has been demolished time and again by archaeological evidence, linguistic yeah. evidence, historical yeah. linguistic evidence, now is again substantiated by the genetic uh, prehistory that we have been, we have been yeah. discovering, yeah. particularly what you talked about, the archaeogenetic uh, yeah. history. Yeah. So how do you see your reaction to your book from that, those quarters? See, this is uh, very amusing because... Uh, what we know is that all of the large population groups in the world are the result of mixtures and the result of migrations. Whether it is, you are talking about the Europeans, the Americans, the Japanese, the Australians, there is no large population group in the world that is not a result of major migrations that happened in prehistory. You know, Todi, the huh. other thing they talk about, if yeah. there is any pure group, it is bound to die out. Because hybrid That's right. is what survives much better. That's right. And if there is any group that can claim to be pure, you can be certain that is some, uh, some group that is so far out and, in, you know, in some very isolated part of the world, which has never had contact with the rest of the world. So the, the, the idea of race itself has gone out of uh, fashion. Uh, fashion. The idea of pure groups or uh, populations that were swayambhu or, you know, what you could call self-auto-generated, all that, all those ideas have been discarded. We are all mixtures of populations and we need, and, and, the, and there is nothing specific, there is nothing peculiar or surprising about the fact that Indian population is also, like other populations, a result of major migrations that happened in the past. It's only the supremacists of different varieties, whether that white nationalist or the Aryan yeah. nationalists here, yeah. the, what we call also the Hindu nationalist or Hindu Tubadis. Yeah. They are the ones who are contesting that the history of the human race is the history of migrations and mixtures. If you will give me a little time, I would like to tackle this at some, some depth. 
their arguments uh, essentially is based on emotive arguments saying the idea of uh, they don't have problems with any, any of the other three migrations. They have problem with only one migration, which is the Central Asian steppe migration, which brought Indo-European languages and who called themselves Adya. Their objection to this has been that, uh, on the one hand, that uh, this is something that makes the, the idea of Adyan migration was proposed by the Westerners or the British to make themselves superior to, and say that they brought civilization to India. But this is not, this is absolutely wrong because we had a civilization, the largest in the world, both by area and by population, which is the Harappan civilizations before the idea arrived. To, so to suggest that anyone who supposed, uh, proposed the idea, idea migration theory uh, is suggesting that civilization was brought to India by that migration is wrong. That's not, that's not, that's not true, if at all. Uh, in fact, it's the other way around. Our civilization, uh, it, 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 it took more than a thousand years for the second urbanization to happen after the idea arrived. So the argument is actually in the reverse altogether. The other point is that the idea migration, the idea of the idea migration, makes the, it, it was made because it makes the Europeans feel superior in some way. This is wrong. Now we know that the Europeans and South Asians are both equally recipients of migrations that happened from the Central Asian steppe. So it doesn't and put earlier from West Asia. That, that's right. Earlier from West Asia. Earlier from West Asia. It doesn't put anybody on a superior base, even if you assume the false uh, assumption that being the source of uh, migration somehow it puts you on a higher pedestal, which is ridiculous in any case. In any case, nobody is talking about the, your steppes population being superior that, anyway, either right. in Europe or in South that's Asia. Right. So this superiority inferiority argument is utterly baseless. But that's not all. Then they say the idea of the area migration has been meant to divide the people. Now, this is utter, utter nonsense because what do we know now? We now know from genetic evidence that the Harappans were the ancestors of both North Indians and South Indians because they moved. Once their civilization declined, they moved both to no east towards North, what is today North India and South towards South India. So, so the Harappan civilization is the common heritage of both. Of both. And uh, so this is, this is not divisive. We also know that today that uh, almost all population groups in the country carry 50 to 65 percent of their ancestry from the first Indians, that is out of Africa migrants who reached here 65,000 years ago. What and does that show you? Much higher proportion among the women. That's right. What does that uh, uh, show you? It shows that uh, the tribals, which many of the rest of the population so far used to consider as some way very, very different from us, actually the closest relatives by far that the rest of the Indian population has. They are their blood relatives and there's nobody they are clo more closely related to than the tribals. Is this divisiveness? So the idea that the idea of idea migration or the recent discoveries are more divisive has no basis whatsoever. So if you remove one by one all of the arguments that are put against uh, idea migration, then what are you left with? So the argument that they are putting forward is not really the reason for the opposition to the idea of migrations and the shaping of, of the Indian population. Then there must be some other reason that is really not spelt out that uh, is why there is opposition to the idea of migration. And what could that be? That's, let's think about it. When we say that it is multiple migrations that form the Indian population, like all other populations in the world, what that means is that our culture is a mixture, is a result of mingling between people who came to this, uh, to this land at different points of time, especially for, for major migrations that happened in uh, uh, prehistory. Four, because uh, the first one uh, from West, a the, uh, from out of Africa migrants, then from West Asia, and the third one which we haven't discussed, which is the result of uh, agricultural expansion happening from uh, uh, China, which brought Austroasiatic languages to India, and they 
uh, you know, they changed the demography of Southeast Asia and finally those languages reached India too. These are Khasi and Mundari, uh, um, etc. So these, are, these four migrations shaped our culture. So what, which means you cannot, it is, uh, it is false and baseless to look at Indian culture as, uh, as flowing from a singular source, source. which is but Arya there, Vedic Sanskrit. You know, there is something even more fundamental. Yeah. Basically, if you say yeah. that those who brought the Vedas yeah. are from outside, yeah. then you have the problem that yeah. Muslims are not invaders yeah. any different from, shall we say, the Vedic people. And that is really the problem, that huh? Hinduism and Islam both come from outside, if that is so, yeah. then this whole argument about India being uh, the, you know, the shall we say, the Punya Bhumi of the Hindus yeah. and the primordial land of the Hindus then comes into question. It's yeah. a nationalism, what is to be called the blood and race version of nationalism, which is what they're really talking about. And using religion only as a, shall we say, a marker, race is a marker for this. I would agree with you, but I would, I would, say, I would still think it is the, uh, my, the earlier argument of what is our culture that is more fundamental. Uh, this this one is fundamental to you, but not to them. Because as far as they are concerned, the only issue is getting the Muslims to be declared as invaders. That's the that, only purpose of that argument. That is true. Because in a broader sense, it also means, once you, once you accept this, uh, what science says, it also means that you have no basis to look at migrations as, uh, uh, as something negative. That's how all world populations formed. Exactly. And so that is a mixture. Yeah. People are mixtures. So what you are propounding is yes. what the correct or shall we say the more inclusive view yes. or the more scientific view of migration should be. Yeah. What they are propounding is an ideological view of the Indian nation. Yes. And in this, unfortunately, science has no role. That's and, right. And unfortunately for them, That's right. increasingly science they, as well as earlier historical yeah. record, archaeological record, shows essentially the same thing. Absolutely, I agree with you. The scientific evidence goes against the political project of dividing people into insiders and outsiders. Exactly. So that's the issue. That's right. I hope, Tony, that you will come here again and uh, explain uh, later developments which are to take which are take place. The Rakhigari archaeogenetic evidence has still to come out officially. That's right. So we are still waiting for that paper, but we know yeah. that the Rakhigari, which was uh, does not show yeah. uh, any, shall we say, step signature, yeah. is a clear indicator that this is the ancient substratum of what you call the Harappan people. Yeah. And that is predating the Central Asian example. Absolutely. Absolutely. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Tony. Hope Thank to you see much. you more, more of you in NewsClick. Very gladly. This is all the time we have for NewsClick today. Do keep watching NewsClick and also do visit our website.